There are few things in the world as simple as sand and none as complicated as microchips. But when you think about how the silicon in sand can be transformed into tiny devices with millions of components, it kind of sounds unbelievable. So how are microchips made? And why does it take a whopping 12 hours to make one of them, even with the most sophisticated and expensive technology known to man? Microchips are made from silicon in multi-billion dollar fabrication plants called fabs. Why silicon? Well, because it is a semiconductor. Under some conditions, it conducts electricity. Under others, it acts as an insulator. This can be achieved through the addition of impurities, a process called doping. Not only does this allow us to meet the needs of different electronic devices, but also allows us to control the passage of electrical signals. Furthermore, silicon is found in abundance in nature, making things much more cost-effective. Unfortunately, most of the silicon found in the wild is chemically bound to oxygen, so the two elements must be separated. Sand is combined with carbon dioxide and melted in crucibles to produce carbon monoxide and 99.9% .9 pure silicon. After further processing, ultra-pure silicon is produced. Next, a seed crystal is put in contact with molten silicon. As the seed crystal is pulled away, silicon atoms attach to its surface, producing a single crystal of pure silicon. Next, a thin, round wafer of silicon is cut off the ingot using a precise cutting machine called a wafer slicer. Each slice is about 0.01 to 0.025 inches thick. The surface on which the integrated circuits are to be formed is polished to get rid of any impurities. This and subsequent steps take place in a clean room environment where the air is filtered to remove foreign particles. The few equipment operators in the room wear lint-free garments, gloves, and coverings for their heads and feet. Since some microchip components are sensitive to certain frequencies of light, even the light sources are filtered. The surfaces of the wafers are then coated with a layer of silicon dioxide to form an insulating base and to prevent any oxidation of the silicon, which could cause impurities. The silicon dioxide is formed by subjecting the wafer to superheated steam at about 1830 degrees Fahrenheit, 1000 degrees Celsius under several atmospheres of pressure to allow the oxygen and the water vapor to react with the silicon. Controlling the temperature and length of exposure controls the thickness of the silicon dioxide layer. Before the circuit can be printed onto the surface of the silicon wafer, the design of the circuit is prepared on a computer-aided drafting machine. The image is then made into what is called a mask. These masks are opaque in certain areas and clear in others and act as stencils, defining the patterns and structures that will be transferred onto the silicon wafer during the photolithography process. A drop of photoresist material is placed in the center of the silicon wafer, and the wafer is spun rapidly to distribute the photoresist over the entire surface. The photoresist is then baked to remove the solvent. The next step is the most critical in the entire process, and it's where everything comes together. The wafer goes into the photolithography machine where ultraviolet light shines on it through the mask and a lens that concentrates the light onto the small area of the microchip. Wherever the UV light passes through the transparent regions of the mask, it exposes the underlying photoresist on the wafer. This exposure causes a chemical change in the photoresist, causing it to harden. By doing this, the circuitry pattern that was initially on the mask now becomes embedded in the wafer. Because the spaces between circuits and components are so small, ultraviolet light with a very short wavelength is used to squeeze through the tiny clear areas on the mask. Beams of electrons or x-rays are also sometimes used to irradiate the photoresist. After exposure to light, the wafer undergoes a chemical etching process. This removes the areas that were unexposed to the UV light, leaving a three-dimensional microchip. To create transistors and other electronic components, specific areas of the silicon need to be doped with impurities to alter their electrical properties. Dopants, such as phosphorus or boron, are introduced through a process called diffusion, or ion implantation. This step defines the conductive and insulating regions of the microchip. 
Various materials, such as metals and insulators, are deposited onto the wafer's surface using techniques like chemical vapor deposition CVD, or physical vapor deposition PVD. These deposited layers form the conductive paths and insulating layers that make up the chip's circuitry. Multiple layers of circuits are built up through a series of repeating lithography and etching steps. Each iteration adds complexity to the chip's design. Since microchips are essentially circuits built on an incredibly small scale, they have a basic set of components. Capacitors can temporarily store an electrical charge. Resistors help control the electrical current. Transistors can either amplify or switch the electrical signals passing through. For highly advanced chips like those found in high-end graphics cards, there can be over 28 billion transistors on board. The more number of transistors, the more the computational power. After the fabrication process, the wafer undergoes testing to identify and eliminate defective chips. This is a critical quality control step to ensure the functionality of the final product. Once the individual chips on the wafer are verified, they are separated and placed into protective packages. These packages provide electrical connections and protect the chip from external elements. The packaged chips undergo final testing to ensure they meet the specified performance criteria. This testing includes functional, electrical, and sometimes environmental tests. Despite the controlled environment and use of precision tools, a high number of integrated circuit chips are rejected. Although the percentage of reject chips has steadily dropped over the years, the task of making an interwoven lattice of microscopic circuits and components is still difficult, and a certain amount of rejects are inevitable. When we look into the future, the next major leap in the advancement of electronic devices, if such a leap is to come, may involve an entirely new circuit technology. Better devices than the very best microprocessor have always been known to be possible. The human brain, for example, processes information much more efficiently than any computer, and some futurists have speculated that the next generation of processor circuits will be biological rather than mineral. If you like this video and want to check out how other stuff is made, head on over to our channel.